And today, here at Growth Marketing Stage, Christina is speaking on how to grow in a very competitive environment. Welcome. <laughs> First, I want to say thank you to Yaroslav and the team for uh, helping me get some of my voice back. Uh, so this is a growth conference, and I will say the day-over-day uh, -day improvement in my voice is significant. Uh, yesterday, I could barely whisper uh, KLM to get on my flight here. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to um, share a little bit with you about my experience on how you can unlock growth in your product and business even when you're in a very competitive environment. So a bit about me. I started at Intuit. Uh, it, it's a small business and finance US-based company. And at Intuit, that is really where I started to understand what product was and what marketing was. And this was actually before growth uh, was even a role that you could have at a company. And after I was at into it, I was in um, Toronto, and at that time I was leading their personal finance product, um, a very global brand called Quicken, but there was a, a smaller competitor called Mint.com in the US. And it's important for me to kind of highlight what Mint and the acquisition that Intuit eventually did, because for me there was two things that happened. One, it showed how a smaller company could do things differently in the same space and win and get acquired uh, by the much bigger and more well-known brand. And second, for me personally, this was the first time that I actually saw the, the magic that can happen when you're working at a much smaller um, privately held company. Uh, but I was there post acquisition, so some of the magic was kind of not there quite anymore. And I knew for me, the next role that I would take would be at a, a startup. So that led me to Eventbrite, um, and Eventbrite is an online ticket and event marketplace. Um, and at the time, they were US only, and I was hired to help them take some little organic growth that they had seen just naturally in their platform and help them expand around the world. And after Eventbrite, I went to Lyft. Um, Lyft's a ride-sharing company um, that has a very uh, well-known competitor um, in Uber. Um, and I was early on the team there, and I got to see their growth from one million rides ever done uh, to doing one million rides every single day, all while we were facing um, a tremendous amount of competition. And I'm currently at Booking.com, and I'm helping Booking.com by leading product teams to allow them to expand their core hotel product line into new verticals. So that's a bit about me. Um, so you'll say I've seen a bit of competition, and I'll just list some of the competitors um, for each of these companies. But I think the thing to notice here is, um, and with uh, Uber and Lyft, some very public uh, competition. I don't know if Silicon Valley is a show that uh, um, people are able to watch in Ukraine, but uh, the, the intro sequence over the years has had a very uh, fun thing to watch of the Lyft and Uber balloons competing with each other. But is competition a good thing? So who would prefer to work on a product where you are facing no competition? Would anyone want to do that? OK, thanks for being brave. <laughs> Um, I would argue, I'm not going to argue because I'm losing my voice, uh, but that probably won't happen. Um, and the reason why is competition is a given. Um, we can go into some economic principles over on free markets and how you're always going to have competition because if you have a good product, which is why you probably wouldn't want to work with no competitors for too long, if you have a good product, others are going to notice that. And because of competition, you're gonna be forced to differentiate your product, whether that's on price, on promotion, on how you distribute the product. And from that competition, it's a forcing function for you to have innovation. And that benefits businesses, but I also think it benefits all of us as consumers. So what about competition in marketplaces? So Lyft and Eventbrite, um, and also booking our marketplace products. 
So you have to think about both the supply side and the demand side. Um, so what does that really mean? When you're building a marketplace product, you really want to try to solve for liquidity. You can't have too much supply and no demand because that's a bad experience on the supply side. But if you have too much demand and you can't serve the supply, then that's also a bad experience for users coming to your platform. So it's a little bit of this seesaw or scale that you're constantly trying to balance. But when you are facing competition in a marketplace product, you also are going to have two times the amount of competition that's going to come and try to gobble up all of your supply and demand. And that means you're almost forced to look for balance um, on a daily basis. So if we agree that competition's a given, we're always going to have it. The key that I think is how can you actually take the given that competition's always going to be there and use that to an advantage to unlock growth. Um, so I created a bit of a playbook that I've seen um, from my time uh, working across these consumer marketplace companies. Um, so bear with me, competition, winning growth, playbooks. I'll try not to use some overused uh, sports analogies, but it might just happen. Um, but I think there's really three principles that you can use in your product on how you can continue to grow even when there is a lot of competition. So the first is really sticking to your mission. Your company and your product was probably founded for a reason, so try to not get distracted by other things out there. Um, the mission for your company should really be what is establishing the values and helping to foster building very strong teams. Um, and Yara talked earlier about how the culture and the teams that you're building are actually a source for potential growth. So the first rule is stick to your mission. Uh, it's there for a reason. So yeah, OK, now we have a mission. But what do we actually do with that competition? It's out there. So I would say you need to study the competition. It's out there. You need to, to know that they're there, but you can't obsess over what the competition is doing. Because that is really going to go away from the core mission that you have. And it's honestly, it's not a lot of fun. Like copying someone else's product, it might get you a few bits of growth here and there. Uh, but it is not going to allow you to really win. I would say it's very rare that a copycat product comes out and becomes the, the market leader. So it makes more sense to keep an eye on that competition and then focus on the things that you can control. And what you can control are your strengths and your company's strengths. Um, so again, it'll be a lot more fun. It's within your control and you're a little bit more on the, the offense of how you can handle the competition. So now we're going to take a look at the playbook in action, if I can get the clicker to work, um, and apply those three principles um, to my time first at Eventbrite. So Eventbrite was founded on the idea of bringing people together through live experiences. And what this kind of meant to us as the team internally uh, was what we called democratizing ticketing. So that meant that it shouldn't be just a you know, large stadium who has access to event ticketing software. Um, it shouldn't just be a, you know, a music event that has access to this. It should really be for, for everyone. Um, and by sticking to that vision, Eventbrite was able to see tremendous growth over uh, their, uh, I think it was 10 years um, recently. Um, so one example that I want to show is how over time, by sticking to the mission, it was actually able to have growth. Um, so this hasn't changed. This is the, the newest UI. When I worked on it, it was a little uh, different. Um, but the one thing is the, the price point. So the price point here is $0. That, if you were trying to focus on growth too much or trying to go too specific to a larger event, that would be like a loss. It would be like, oh, zero dollar event, like this is not something that we want. But for Eventbrite, because we were sticking to the mission of democratizing ticketing and having a horizontal platform, that actually became a flywheel for growth. So people that would initially create a free event 
over time, we could use growth principles, and a lot of the previous speakers have talked about how you can optimize. We are able to convert them into a paid user and get growth. And by having the free event, it created the supply that you know that you need in a marketplace. So on the competition side, um, I filled in many of a global map at my time leading the global expansion at Eventbrite with the, the color orange. Um, and the key here is one of the first things that I did when I joined the team and now that I encourage my teams to do is to create almost a matrix. Know who's out there, know their strengths, know a little bit about their feature set, their pricing. Update it regularly, keep an eye on it. It might come in handy one day. And then leave it over there and go back to doing what your product strategy is that ties to your vision. And we were able to apply kind of the keeping an eye on the competition and knowing who was out there directly to our global expansion strategy. Because we knew that we were getting at the time around 5% of our ticket sales from international markets. So some of those we could go out and get organically, and then others maybe we weren't as well suited for, maybe we didn't have the right product market fit, or there was a leader who was already there and so far along that it didn't make sense to go to that market at that point in time. So from an organic growth perspective, we were able to identify that the United Kingdom made a lot of sense for Eventbrite to launch first. And we were able to open up operations there <laughs> and um, grow uh, significantly year over year and actually turn that into their European hub. But on the flip side, we also wanted to be in uh, regions like Latin America. And as a smaller company, you are always prioritizing. Prioritizing your resources, prioritizing what to work on, what not to work on. And an example of how we got inorganic growth by knowing who our competitors were was actually taking a decision to say, you know what, we're gonna use our team and develop these features that are core to us in that horizontal platform. And we're actually gonna work to bring some of these competitors who are out there into our family. And by doing that, we are able to accelerate our growth um, in markets such as Latin America um, and then also here in Europe. So some of the strengths that we developed um, early on uh, were kind of how do you know your product better than anybody else. Um, so we were obsessed with the thing we could control, not the competition, but what we could control was the two critical product flows. Um, and it wasn't around testing the color of these buttons. It was around really understanding the user experience on both sides of the marketplace. Um, on the event creator side, how do we get them to hit publish and put their event live? And then on the ticket purchaser side, how do we get to them to the point where they're ready to click order now and commit to going to that event? And we were able to do that by fostering teams that knew that these were the most important flows. It would help us balance the marketplace. And then we also established a world-class customer service organization. Um, they called themselves the We Rock team. They had a lot of fun with it. Um, but that also became a strength when you looked versus one of our large competitors globally, um, which is Ticketmaster. So because we were obsessed with those two flows, we knew that people always kind of were like, how much is the ticket really gonna cost me? Uh, and we had a principle early on that fees should be broken out in each line item. It should be very clear that there are going to be fees. Um, and some of our competitors weren't as transparent with that. And we were able to kind of play to that strength and make that really visible. And that helped create a better user experience. And it also had a lot of business impact because it would create less customer support calls by people being like, what is this $1.17 fee? Like, I didn't know I was paying this. So with Eventbrite, we really were able to see success um, by sticking to the mission of really bringing people together to experience live events, keeping an eye on that competition, both for organic and inorganic growth, and playing to the core strengths. And Eventbrite recently IPO'd. I checked this because I think it's a little outdated. It's not quite as green anymore, um, but the US markets aren't doing good, so I'm gonna blame it on that. So my next example of how you can take a playbook and really grow your product uh, when you're facing tough competition is my time at Lyft. Um, so Lyft has a very public competitor in Uber. 
Um, but we were able to continue to grow and the company still experiences tremendous growth. Um, and there are a myriad of reasons why, but I attribute a lot of them to these three principles of sticking to the mission, keeping an eye on the competition, and then playing to the strengths. So Lyft was really founded on this vision um, by the two co-founders of improving people's lives through the world's best transportation. And for me, working at Lyft, you felt this every single day. And we are able to visualize what the mission should be through some of these images. Um, so this one over here is kind of a futuristic view of what a city should look like. And Lyft, we really believe that transportation shouldn't be dominating the way that people interact with their city. Um, it should work with the city. But we all know we have cars and we have highways and we have parking lots today. So how in the short term can Lyft make the experience of getting in a car and going from point A to point B better? And by knowing that that was the vision, it allowed us as product teams the ability to have laser focus on what we should be doing. That meant that we were able to launch Lyft line, which was kind of how do we get more people to share one ride uh, versus going at just you and the driver. Um, and that feature was kind of built off the history of Lyft, which was actually a, a long distance car pulling product. But if we were not sticking to our vision, it could have been very easy at that point in time to say, oh, well, we need to quickly develop the ability to, you know, you know, ship packages back and forth or get into food delivery. And yes, those are things that we could do with the product team that we had, but they didn't tie into that vision, therefore they weren't going to get prioritized. Um, and one of the last projects I worked on at Lyft was actually, if you think about it, a little controversial. Like, why would Lyft want to show you in the app public transportation and encourage you to get on the train or the bus instead of getting a ride and getting to a place where Lyft could really monetize that transaction. But if because we are sticking to the vision, it actually made sense. If all of us right now, if we all, you know, after the after party, of course, leave and are trying to go somewhere, that would mean that the roads out here would get very congested. And it might actually make more sense at that point in time to say, hey, it might actually be faster if you take this local train to a different area and then get a ride. Um, so by sticking to the vision, it allowed Lyft to really have growth and build a product that was meeting their users' needs. And we all did this uh, when we were facing very tough competition in Uber. Um, and I would always work with my teams on focusing, um, so kind of like a horse with blinders. Um, you couldn't obsess on what the competition was doing because that would be your entire day and your happy hour and everything afterwards. Um, so this actually became a strength for Lyft over time because we developed this mental muscle of no, like we need to run our own race, like we need to stick to our own vision. Um, so over time, by keeping an eye, like they were out there, like we didn't have to do too much to know that they were out there. Um, we were able to stick more towards what was gonna grow the company in the direction that we wanted to grow. So some of the strengths that I saw at Lyft early on were the focus on users, and in particular, the drivers. Um, so remember, in a, in a marketplace, you need to focus on both the, the supply and demand. But at Lyft, this didn't feel like a, okay, like I must focus on supply. It came naturally to the company. Um, and that was because we thought of drivers not as you know, the professional way that you know, someone who's gonna get me from point A to point B. Um, a lot of drivers at Lyft originally um, were friends, they were family, um, some then later became employees of the company. So it always made sense that we would wanna treat them the same way that we treat the passenger and the same way we treated each other in the office. So that led us to build things that maybe didn't seem at the time like a growth channel, but they just made sense. Um, so from one of the first payment flows that I worked on at Lyft, um, had a, a tipping function already there. And it just made sense. Like people might wanna tip the ride and the driver would make extra money by having tips. And this is not something the competition um, had at that point in time, but it made sense um, to Lyft. And it also became a growth lever because we were able to show drivers that they could earn more money on our platform because they had this tip functionality built in. 
Another example of kind of playing to the strengths was with express pay. So at Lyft, you were definitely encouraged to do dog fooding, um, so using the product on a daily basis. And one thing that I heard all the time from drivers was the reason why they drive with Lyft is they view themselves as their own entrepreneur. They're their own boss. But why do they need to wait to get their money until you know, Tuesday, which was the, the day that we did regular payouts? Um, and because we were listening to the drivers and we knew that you know, this is probably going to make sense, we actually had to go and work with Stripe, our payment provider, to build out this technology in the US to do an instant debit to their account. Um, and similar to the, um, Chris talking about Shopify earlier, like we had a cha-ching sound, and, and that's an incentive. That's something that it's going to make the driver want to continue driving with, with you. Um, so that became an example of another way that by listening to our users, um, we were able to drive growth. Um, but kind of going back to keeping an eye on the competition, because Lyft at the time had really focused on being a value-driven company to make things that meant to grow their vision, they also were able to capitalize when the competition kind of had a, a downturn and a falter. So Uber had a tough 2017, and because like we had the, the blinders on, when there was a moment, the team was ready, and it was it wasn't like, oh no, what do we do? Like, we're not ready. It's like, no, like we know what we need to do and this is our moment to capitalize. And that was able to take tremendous growth the company was already seeing and allowed them to increase the market share uh, during that downturn. So with Lyft, we were definitely able to apply the playbook and see growth in the company by sticking to their mission of improving people's lives through the best transportation. It let us focus on things that were really gonna help people get around cities and get from point A to point B um, and not on additional verticals. We kept an eye on the competition but developed the strength to focus on what we could control and what we were strong at. Um, and that has allowed Lyft to continue to grow um, I think that one ends at 2018, and just recently they announced that they were able to hit the 1 billion ride mark. So I started at Lyft uh, about five years ago when I was there now, and we were just at 1 million, and now they're at a billion. Um, so that just shows that you're able to um, really experience growth if you're focusing on those three key things. And so now I'm over at Booking, and I'll talk a little bit about how in my... Uh, short tenure there, I think you can also see these three principles um, helping that company experience growth. So booking was really uh, founded on this idea of allow people and empower people to experience the world. And that can be a very broad vision statement, um, but it's meant to actually show the, the range of what booking is trying to offer. They're not just a, a hotel platform. Uh, and because of that, that also means there's lots of other competitors that are out there that we do, in my experience, we keep an eye on them, but you're able to focus on the things that you can control. And one of the things, and Booking is over 20 years old as a company, um, but one of the things that has been consistent across the time um, that the company has grown is their focus on data. Um, so that's definitely a strength that the company has built up over time. And it's evolved, like technology has certainly evolved over uh, 20 years. You know, booking started with, why should I pick up the phone to call a hotel? Let me just figure out a way to do this online um, to today. Um, and booking definitely has a A-B testing culture. And there have been a lot of experts on this today that you've heard from who have given you a lot of tips and tricks on how you can use this. Um, and at any given time, I think Booking's running over a thousand A-B tests on the website. And for me, that, that's impressive in itself. But it's also the fifth largest e-commerce company. And because of that, it means you have the volume to see trends that your competitors maybe wouldn't have seen at that point in time. And that's actually allowed Booking to continue to evolve their strategy. Um, and my team is focused on how you can expand into different types of accommodation verticals and get growth that Booking doesn't have today. And some of the 
teams that we're looking at, actually one of them is, is hostels. And we're able to see that because of the volume that was coming in and the A-B tests that we are running. So we are using the strength of being very data focused on a way to continue to get growth in new areas um, over the, you know, the years of the company's trajectory. Yeah, so for booking, I believe that this will continue to grow. Um, I've seen how in my division that we're able to really stick to the mission of allowing people to, um, empowering them to experience the world, keeping an eye on that competition, um, not obsessing over it. Like, there's always like, oh, what about Airbnb? But the thing is, like, booking actually has more listings on the, the private uh, inventory of like apartments and homes and they were able to do that again because of their strength of seeing that people were coming in and wanting to book these types of accommodations which was a bit of a, a change in the industry right you know ten years ago I don't think people were like oh I really I want to go and visit this place and I'm gonna stay in a stranger's home like that didn't exist but booking has been able to evolve their product uh, by kind of using their strengths of data So those are kind of three examples of what I've seen in my experience. I think for each of you, there are going to be some things that you can apply to your individual product. Um, but for me, it's really about taking your teams, having them understand the mission and the value of your company, keeping an eye on that competition that is out there, uh, but not letting it drive your decisions and your prioritization and then really playing to your strengths. And I think by doing that, you're able to unlock growth even when you are facing competition. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have a time slot for the questions, so. Yeah, thanks for, for the nice talk, especially for growing marketplaces. And like your topic was if you, um, if, you if how small companies, marketplaces can be big, uh, beat bigs, right? Um, I mean, if, uh, if you would see that there's still, still new growing company, like a uh, competitor of like Uber, Lyft, and Booking, uh, Airbnb, or in such categories, would you still recommend to start, try a new one, or you think it's already monopolized? Thanks. I would say it really depends on how you intend to enter the, comp the, the marketplace because it goes back to how do you differentiate your product, right? So competition's always going to be there, but are you going to offer a different price? Are you going to have a different feature set? Are you going to offer like a different distribution channel, you know, superior customer service? Um, so I would say if you can answer like, yes, you think what you're, is, what you're doing is different and you believe that there's you know, a sizable market for that differentiation kind of like bubble, um, I think it would make sense. Because um, having a lot of competition, as I said earlier, like I don't think it's a bad thing. In a way, it's like you can see that people want this. There's already demand, and it's just knowing how your product would fit into that marketplace. Good, thank you.